Hey everyone, welcome to your episode 298 of the At Percussion Podcast. My name is Ben Charles, and with me as always are Ksenia Kaminovich. Hello, Ben. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How's Corpus? Uh, well, uh, stormy. Uh, but we'll see. And the lovely Casey Cangelosi. Hey, how's it going, Ben? Hi, everybody. I'm doing well. Ksenia always introduces me as the lovely, so I thought I'd try it on, try it on you to see how it works. <laughs> And That's Carly fine. Vigna. But I don't get to be lovely? The lovely, wonderful oh, Carly Vigna. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we are recording this episode on September 12th, but it is going live. You're listening to this hopefully on September 23rd. Carly, what happened today in history on September 23rd? Yeah, we got a good birthday uh, today on September 23rd. John Coltrane was born in 1926, which is pretty nice. He was born in Hamlet, North Carolina. Um, I think I'll tell you a little bit, but I'm sure many of you are aware Coltrane was a very well-known and really accomplished jazz saxophone player. He was especially known for incorporating modal harmonies, like kind of what you hear on Miles Davis's Kind of Blue from 1959, and also really well-known for his work in bebop and hard bop earlier in his career, and then later um, avant-garde jazz. Coltrane released 25 albums as a leader, and some of the most famous of these albums are Blue Train, Giant Steps, My Favorite Things, and A Love Supreme. He was really famous for collaborations with Miles Davis and Thelonious Monk, among many others. Um, and actually, Coltrane started playing with Miles Davis in 1955. And in case you ever need a reminder that as musicians, we are totally all prone to imposter syndrome, here's a quote from John Coltrane about his early work with Miles Davis. He said, I am quite ashamed of those early records I made with Miles. Why he picked me, I don't know, which, you know, I'm sure if you or I or anybody listens to those records, you're not like, oh, that is so bad. You know, like, I guess we all have those thoughts sometimes, you know, of comparing our work to others and earlier work and that kind of thing. So um, Coltrane was really well known to be a hardworking, virtuosic player and a little bit crazy, a little bit fanatical about practicing. Um, there's a story that fellow jazz saxophone player Jimmy Heath uh, he tells about a time that there was a noise complaint in a hotel they were staying at in San Francisco. Um, so rather than stop practicing, Coltrane just practiced fingerings for a full hour after it was told, hey, you got to stop. Um, and there's also kind of legends that, that say it was common for Coltrane to fall asleep with the saxophone still in his mouth um, or to practice a single note for hours and hours on end. Um, Coltrane unfortunately died young at the age of 40 from liver cancer that may have stemmed from his earlier struggles in his life with heroin and with alcohol. Um, he had quit all substances cold turkey earlier in his life after Miles Davis fired him from the band for nine months in 1957. It was, you know, substances were getting in the way of his work and his, um, I'm sure, reliability and, and creative work. Um, and so after that time, he he's like, OK, I quit. And he went on to have so much musical success in those. He was alive for nine years after that time. So in those years, he was was a bulk of really, really good work. He's really widely recognized as an influential and accomplished sax player, um, both during his lifetime. But he's also received like a lot of really cool honors posthumously. In 1995, the U.S. Postal Service pulled put Coltrane on a commemorative postage stamp. So that's pretty cool. Um, in 1997, he received the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. In 2001, My Favorite Things, his recording um, was chosen by the National Endowment for the Arts for its list of 360 songs of the century. And in 2007, Coltrane was awarded a Pulitzer Prize for a lifetime of innovative and influential work. So um, very, very accomplished human being and musician. What I found maybe the most striking about everything that I read about Coltrane um, when I was researching him this week was the way that music for him was a vehicle for connecting with people and for making the world a better place. So I will leave you on Coltrane with just a few quotes from him. Um, he said this was in, a, I think, a letter to listeners in 1964, just a couple, couple years before he died. Um, he writes, I humbly ask to be given the means and privilege to make others happy through music. 
And then there's another another nice quote from him. I think the year that he died, he he said, I know that there are bad forces, forces that bring suffering to others and misery to the world. I want to be the opposite force. I want to be the force which is truly for good. So I invite you today to listen to some John Coltrane if you feel so inclined um, to celebrate him on the 95th anniversary of his birth. Cool. I just wanted to add one of my favorite John Coltrane facts is that John Coltrane and Ravi Shankar had a mutual admiration for each other. And John Coltrane actually named his son Ravi after Ravi Shankar. Yeah. And if anyone's not familiar, Ravi Shankar is maybe the, the most well-known Indian musician of all time, um, sitar player. So awesome job, Carly. Thanks so much for that. Well, let's get on to introducing our guest for the day. Our guest today is Chad Crummel. Chad is the principal percussionist of the Chattanooga Symphony, and he just recently won the Navy Band audition, which we'll talk about today. He performed in Japan for three years in the Hyogo Performing Arts Center Orchestra, and he won the 2016 Modern Snare Drum Competition. So welcome to the podcast, Chad. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, excited to be here and to chat about percussion and I guess my recent uh, audition and whatnot. So let's get yeah, it. Let's Let's get right to it. So speaking of your uh, recent audition, congratulations on, on winning that audition. Uh, what was your, your preparation like for this audition? How'd you balance your audition with your other work schedule? And how was the band audition similar to and different from an orchestra audition? Sure. Uh, so we'll take that from um, just how, how was the prep for this audition? It was different than anything I had done before because it had come out of COVID essentially, you know, uh, out of 2020, this was the first audition I'd taken since, you know, all that hit and, uh, the preparation was vastly different than anything I'd done before. I essentially, I took a huge, um, I took a huge break in, in 2020 from, from excerpt playing and auditions because obviously there, there was nothing going on. So I just, I, I felt sort of burnout at that point. I think towards the, you know, the first few months of 2020, I was working probably the most I'd ever worked um, freelancing and, and playing around with different orchestras. I have my job here in Chattanooga, but I also travel a ton to um, sort of make up for um, the, the smaller uh, job this is, you know, I'm, I'm traveling each week to play with a different orchestra to sort of make it work. And that those like January, February, and March just happened to be crazy intense months. I was like all over the country playing with different orchestras and completely burnt out. And then when that, when the world kind of stopped, I sort of stopped with it and was like, okay, maybe this is, maybe this is a point where I can take a step back from this sort of crazy world of orchestral auditions, because at that point it had been like, 10 years of just, I felt like nonstop taking orchestra auditions, which seems crazy. I mean, I started, I think I took my first audition when I was a sophomore in undergrad and it kind of just like kept going through grad school. And then when I was in Hyogo and then went in here and it just like never ended and, you know, some success and a lot of not success and it's just a lot to, to take. Um, and 2020 was just the much needed break that I needed from that sort of, um, I don't know, audition lifestyle and, and the practice that goes into that. And so I, I took a break from, from percussion playing and I was already sort of, I'd been biking, uh, like road cycling sort of for fun for a few years before that, and saw this as an opportunity to one, do something with all the free time that I now had when I wasn't traveling to get some exercise and be outside and away from people during COVID instead of, you know, being indoors and whatnot. And, and just sort of putting my time and energy and focus into something else. And so I just went like headfirst into cycling and training and trying to pretend to be like a actual cyclist. I don't know. It was super fun to just like completely derail your, um, lifestyle and just like pretend to be an athlete for a little bit, even though I wasn't, you know, but <laughs> I would just went full on training into that and, you know, started to find the similarities between that sort of 
high end athletic training and, you know, and practicing and, and music and all the things that sort of cross over. And, um, you know, one of my former teachers at Stefan had been a, uh, a really good, uh, cyclist when he was sort of younger. And I remember him telling me stories about sort of his, the way that he prepped, um, for races and, and, um, how that, how he took that sort of success and then transferred it into his audition prep later on when he sort of went on the run after Fort Worth, when he won Dallas and then Pittsburgh, and then went on to win San Francisco. He sort of took that athlete mentality of preparation and building up this, um, form and then, you know, executing it on the day of the race or the audition or whatever. And, and I remember him talking about that a long time ago and it didn't really hit me the same way because I wasn't cycling at that point. And then as I started to last year, I was like, okay, I sort of remember these things that he was talking about. And, um, yeah, really just went crazy into cycling for a year. And that sort of led into this big trip that I did, uh, last July, um, which was a solo bike packing trip, um, along the whole Blue Ridge Parkway from uh, Afton, Virginia, all the way down to Cherokee, North Carolina. So I just strapped like some bags on my bike, some food and a tent and whatnot, and was sort of alone in the woods and on the parkway for six or seven days, just making my way down the, the parkway. And it was, it just gave me a lot of time to, to think and to, um, I don't know, just get away from the craziness that was 2020. I'm sure everyone had their own weird, awful experience, but this was my way to sort of cope with that. And, um, when I came back, I, I knew that I needed to get back in the practice room at some point. I just didn't know when that time would be. I wanted it to be when I felt ready and when I felt motivated because I wasn't before that I was, I really needed that, that break. And then as the sort of, uh, you know, winter, came on 2020 you know, work started coming back. And so that sort of forced me to start playing a little bit here and there, but not as many excerpts, I guess, but, um, none of this audition popped up online, maybe around December, or January, something like that. And it was, I was ready to, to dig my teeth into something and, and, uh, to get back at it. I just really needed a break, uh, from, excerpt practicing which can be just kind of mind numbing sometimes um and I, I needed that break and and it was uh really refreshing to jump back in and make the tape um they did a tape round first for the navy band and to um just sort of put all my cycling energy back into that and made the tape got invited and then just sort of kept with it and i was still doing the cycling at this point as well and started racing actually this year in 2021 and started doing a few races and won a few races and was sort of taking that and building up my audition prep at the same time. And then sort of phased out the cycling a few weeks before the audition, just so I wouldn't crash and get injured. And then did the last little bit, um, before the, before the audition. And then that was June and it worked. <laughs> You know, one of the one of the parts of that question was uh, how were band and orchestra different uh, auditions different? And I guess the, it sounds like the band ones involve a lot more cycling. Uh, but <laughs> any <laughs> any other major differences? Uh, you know, this was pretty similar. Um, the you know the excerpts are the same. I mean, they had a um, maybe one of the small differences. Um, they had a snare drum solo that you. They were required to play traditional grip um, for when they sort of do the ceremonial band um, type situations and you sling on the sling on the rope drum. They just want to make sure that you can do that and don't look ridiculous, I guess. So uh, that was really the only thing that, you know, it's never really popped up on an orchestra audition. So getting some traditional chops back in the hand, which I sort of have a little bit of, but not a ton of. Um, so that was, that was sort of fun to work on that as well, but most everything else, I mean, it's run the same way you go in and play, you know, around, um, they did it. Um, I think it was basically a semi-final round when we all got invited there. They took, 
there was like 80 tapes and they took that down to eight people, I think, showed up at the Navy Yard. And then we all played a maybe 25 minute round in the morning. They brought that down to three. That was the final round. A little bit of section playing at the end. We played um, like four, I think just symbol bass, triangle with two of the guys from the section. So it felt like an orchestra audition. Everything felt similar. It was just a uh, four band, I guess. <laughs> Uh, I was going to ask a little about, you said, you know, before you needed this break, practicing excerpts was so monotonous, just, you know, I've heard of that um, before. And um, I remember a few years ago, I heard about this, you know, band on excerpts at Juilliard. They said, no more excerpts. You people will do other things and you will learn other stuff. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, I remember going through schools, like I would retreat to the library just to like not hear Porgy and Bess on xylophone. And I remember like listening to music, like the music faded out and then just like through the floor, I could just like hear Porgy and Bess and just like, oh my God, I want to like, but so on anyway, like how, um, just regarding balance, like how, how do you do what you realistically do have to do to, to win one of these auditions, which is, yeah, drill these excerpts nonstop and crazy. But then um, also feel like you're, you're you're playing other things. Is it just a matter of you got to schedule it all and fit it all in? Or do you not play other things while you're really cramming hard for one of these? Yeah, it's sort of balancing how much to play excerpts and how much not to. I mean, I think the majority of my prep when I start and I, when I get a list and I'm starting, it's it's, I guess, not so much drilling the excerpts from day one. It's sort of getting my hands back and the chops back to be able to play the excerpts later on. I mean, at this point, I mean, I, I know the notes for all of the, you know, I'm not learning Porgy at this point. I'm not learning um, almost anything on, on any of the mallet instruments, you know, they're all there, you know, minus maybe they throw in one weird xylophone thing from something we, we haven't learned and I'll have to learn a few notes, but I find myself, yeah, playing those less often. And really it's just trying to build up as much chops and sort of flexibility in the hands and um just sort of getting myself mentally ready to uh to take on that task and i'll start transitioning into the excerpts a month or so before and really start tweaking things and then doing mock auditions and getting getting all in there well chad i know this is sort of a, a cliche question but highly successful musicians such as yourself it seems to have good practice habits. And uh, we did a, a practice special with a couple of uh, prominent practicers a, a couple of episodes ago. But could you tell us about your practice habits, uh, both in terms of like how you schedule it, what kind of hours you're looking at, maybe historically when you were, when you were in school and now that you're obviously out of school, um, as well as like how much time do you spend working on technique versus music and so on? Um, yeah, definitely more on the side of technique and and um just i do like a pretty extensive warm-up and sort of hand session on a, on a pad or on a drum more than i do anything else i've just sort of collected music over the years um whether it's from some of the snare drum competitions that i've done i think i played so many solos in those competitions that i just have like all this snare drum music and i'll use that as sort of warm-ups and and just stuff to play um, to get my hands ready to, to, to take on some of the excerpts. Um, as far as scheduling practice time, I mean, yeah, I don't know. When I, when I was in school, it, it felt different. I think I was just, you just need to, you need so much time to absorb all the stuff that you're learning at this point. Like I said, at least with excerpts, I know most of it. So it's more about trying to, you know, play it, really well at the right time when you need to play it really well, as opposed to just like shedding it for, you know, a thousand hours. And one of the things that I started to pick up on when I was doing a lot of cycling was sort of listening to, um, listening to what my body was telling me when I, you know, I'd be really exhausted one day from doing a six hour ride. And so I would, the next day I would sort of be able to, I would have to change or adjust my workout or my schedule on how I felt and what I thought my body or legs could handle that day. And it started to happen a little bit in the practice room as well. I would be playing and, 
and you know my, my my hands are tired and so it's something's harder than it should be it's not coming out right and so i would know when to sort of take a step back and say like okay there's no point in drilling this anymore like my hands are i'm just tired like i just, i can i know i can play this on a good day there's no point in me sitting here and just making myself frustrated that i can't play it today right now i know i can do it tomorrow or whatever the case is so finding those moments and just finding something else in the practice room to do, whether it's sort of mental practice or a completely different instrument or um, visualizing, you know, around or whatever the case may be. If, if my hands aren't there or I'm just low energy or whatever the case is, just find something else to do and don't just sit there and drill something that's not working. Chad, I hear, I'm hearing so much wisdom in these couple of things that you're saying about practicing, like listen to your body that, you know, we're all guilty of not doing that enough. Um, but also understanding like it, there's so much more that needs to be done than just rep upon rep upon rep of the excerpts. Like if your hands aren't in shape, it's not going to come out. If they are in shape, it's much more likely to come out how you want it to be. So thanks for, thanks for sharing those little nuggets of wisdom with us. Yeah. Yeah, some of it came from, I mean, I, at the same time I was sort of in the middle of the prep, uh, my wife and I were doing actually a ton of work on our house and we we're building a patio. So a lot of that physical strain of like moving stuff with your hand, like shoveling stuff, it just killed, you know, your forearms, and your hands. And I try to come in and play something and I'm like, okay, this is stupid. This isn't, not today. Like, just come back tomorrow. What do you, don't, don't do this today. My, uh, my students complained that on their placement auditions this semester, I made them play uh, tray pack on tambourine and then go straight into Sorcerer's Apprentice on a glockenspiel. They thought that was mean. <laughs> right, yeah. That's a little mean. At least it's not crash cymbals, I find. Like, take four would be worse. <laughs> yeah, crash cymbals to soft snare drum sort of has that same effect. It's not fun. Well, Chad, prior to your time in, in Chattanooga, you performed in the Hyogo Performing Arts Center Orchestra in Japan. What was it like auditioning for a non-American orchestra? And then once you got there, uh, what was the the Japanese cultural experience like? Uh, do you speak any Japanese? <laughs> do you study <laughs> Japanese beforehand? Uh, For our Japanese listeners, Nihongo ga dekimasu ka? <laughs> I, yeah, I, 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 I mean, I think I barely even knew about the audition before I took, I'd never heard of the orchestra. Um, actually, has anyone here heard of this, this group, the Hyogo Performing Arts Center? I'm curious. I'm always curious. Like, what does anyone know what, what this is? No, okay. tell us. Uh, it's it, I essentially tell people it is New World Symphony, but in Japan. It's like a training orchestra for young musicians, you know, right out of that grad school um, timeline. And it's a three year program, same as New World. Uh, very similar setup. They have a, a hall there, and you're performing. You're just pretending to be, you know, a real orchestra. You're, you're performing rep every week and um, getting to play with big conductors and getting to play with famous soloists and um, you're just, I don't know, learning how to how to do do the job. Uh, and I, I hadn't heard of it before. I, I knew of New World. I think I'd I'd taken that audition. I'd subbed there before, but I had a friend in grad school uh, or a roommate that told me about this Japanese uh, version of New World called Hyogo and. So I made a tape and um, got invited to a live round. They do, I don't, I, I, I guess they probably do it the same nowadays, but they do about six live rounds around the world. They, they'll come to like Chicago, New York, London, Berlin, maybe Vienna and like Tokyo or something like that. And they'll, um, they'll go around and, and hear, you know, however many people they, they picked for, uh, for those live rounds. And then, yeah, so I, I ended up, winning a position in this in this orchestra and this was right after my first year of grad school at Carnegie Mellon so I kind of put grad school on hold and was like all right I'm gonna go do this um this thing in Japan and and sort of see what happens but I knew nothing about it beforehand and I didn't know any Japanese I knew nothing and it was yeah it was a wild adventure it was super fun to just be thrown into a a, a different world and uh, especially when you're I was 23 I think when I went and um, to have like a first 
job, you know, it's like, okay, they're paying me to play drums. This is cool. And like, I'm in a, I'm in an orchestra. Like, this is what I, this is what I wanted to do. Was uh, it, so, I mean, you said there were international auditions. Was it mostly Japanese musicians or was it a pretty even international crew? It's actually, yeah, it's really international orchestra as well. They, they try to make it a good blend. So there were people from all over. Uh, I mean, there were just a handful of Americans, probably five or six, maybe. And then all over Europe and all over Asia, Australia, um, South America, one guy uh, from, oh man, I don't know where he's from. But yeah, it was a really unique blend of uh, people from all over, which made a, uh, I mean, it was super fun to, we all lived in like the same apartment complex. And so we're just like hanging out with people from, you know, all parts of the world. And it was, uh, it was a blast. It was, I had a ton of fun. We toured with the orchestra a bunch around Japan. I saw all of Japan like <laughs> multiple times. Um, we did oh yeah, a lot of really amazing concerts over there. And uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was wild to be uh, thrown into something like that. I remember the uh, a funny story, the first night we like moved into our apartments, we had been there for maybe three or four days at that point, like staying in a hotel and we were, they were getting us set up with everything we needed, uh, you know, like a phone and a bank account and like the orchestra office was really helping us out um, sort of get settled in. And first night we moved into our apartments, I had all this stuff that I had sort of bought secondhand off of the previous percussionist who lived in this apartment. He had left after a few years or maybe one or two years. And I basically bought, you know, all this, every all the furniture and whatnot that he left there. And um, a few of us went to the grocery store that first night. And that was a wild experience in itself. We're like trying to figure out like what flower, like, is this flower? I'm trying to like Google translate things. And it wasn't really where I think at that point you couldn't like use the camera function to like, you know, read something. So you had to try to like type, it was a mess. Um, and we got some food and we brought it back to the apartment and I, uh, I had a rice cooker there that I, um, bought from the, from the previous person in the apartment and we're like, okay, we'll make rice. And we have this other food here. This will be great. Well, we were like sitting on the ground trying to figure out this, this meal and the rice maker had like an insane amount of buttons on it. Usually I'm just used to like one button usually is like make rice. But we put the rice in there and it had so many buttons and they were all in Japanese. I had no idea. And we were messing with it for a while. And, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really like do anything or make a noise right away. So we didn't know if it was working. And we kind of just got like fed up with it. And we left and found some like izakaya down the road and like got some karagi, like fried chicken and had some beers. Came back to the apartment and like the whole apartment was smelling like rice whenever we came back. We're like, oh, it, it worked. Okay. So they just you press one of those buttons. So then we came back and then ate rice for dessert and like sat on the floor <laughs> and, was, and we were just sitting there all going like, okay, this is, this is going to be wild. Like this is the first night we came and figure out the rice maker. Okay. And this, this is going to be a cool three years. Um, what's the one thing that you'd say you've learned musically or about collaborating with people in such a diverse environment? Yeah, the one of the cool things that that orchestra did was bring in uh, all these. They called them like uh, guest artist players, and so every week, almost every section in the orchestra had a uh, basically a teacher that they would bring in from whether it's Vienna Phil or Berlin or New York or Chicago, like major orchestras. They would bring in huge players to come sit in. Uh, in the sections with us and play along with us, whether it was they were playing principal or just or just sitting in a section. And so every week there was people from all these major orchestras. And sometimes it was great. Sometimes it was really difficult to play with because these orchestras have such like vastly different styles of playing things and different tuning systems, like, you know, you know, versus like a 440 and you know some european orchestras are, are really up there um it was tough to sort of find that balance of like okay we're all in this together we got to find a way to make this work we're just trying to play a concert like the audience doesn't necessarily know that we're from like literally you know 20 different orchestras 
across the world. We have to find a way to to make this make this work. So I, I mean, that was a, a unique challenge that we dealt with, just sort of trying to play with um, all these different people. And even in the percussion world, a lot of the um, Japanese style of orchestral playing, especially like timpani, is very European and very um, you know sort of Berlin style playing of timpani. And I'm from America and we're very different. And so it was just like, we're always like doing things with different technique and um, just trying to find a way to make that work. But you know, we, we always, always do. We're just trying to make music at the end of the day. But uh, you know, it, it was, reminds me, so, someone once described driving in Miami as you have all these people from different countries and they all have their own driving <laughs> customs and they're all on the same roads driving in their own way. <laughs> it sure, sounds, yeah. like, sounds a lot like driving in Miami. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, Culturally, like, did you did you study Japanese before you went, or did you learn some on the fly? How did the uh, how did the language barrier work for you? Yeah, um, I as soon as I found out that I was going, I was like, okay, I need to like start trying to learn some Japanese, um, and tried to download some stuff online. I think I like found a I don't know pirated version of like Rosetta Stone or something like that, and was trying to learn whatever I could before I I went, um, and it was it was it was really hard it was a struggle for me some people pick up languages i don't know naturally my wife she can just like pick up languages pretty quick and i guess i'm the opposite i was terrible um i eventually i started taking private lessons uh from like a japanese grandma at this like community center they would just like teach foreigners english for essentially free. I think I paid like, you know, like four dollars a lesson or something. I don't know what it was. It was some like like they weren't doing it to make money. They were just like bored grandmothers. And um I did that for a while and realized that like the majority of the Japanese I needed to know revolved around food. That was like most of the interaction that you have with people there is food. Um luckily everything was or food and trains, yeah. Yeah. And what well, in the trains, you know, they've got at least English signs every now, you know, you can, you can make your way around if you only speak English, but you, you walk into some like alley back alley and go into a restaurant in Osaka. Like there's, there's no English on the menu and they don't speak English. So you have to know something. And so that was like the main, I was like, okay, this is the first thing I need to figure out is like how to order food and what, <laughs> what am I ordering? Um, luckily, our, like I said, our orchestra was, because it was an international orchestra, they basically needed to run everything in in English. And so everything at work was was done in English. So it, it didn't have to worry about that side of things. So that made that a little more stress free. Um, but yeah, it was just it was just food based things. Some some of my friends, colleagues, they got really into it and they, you know, they really went like headfirst into studying Japanese. I'd say mainly it was like to like, you know, try to talk to girls <laughs> and they were just like, I need to learn Japanese so I can like meet a girl at a bar. Um, I was in a long-term relationship like the whole time I was over there. So I, I didn't have that need to like learn a lot of like to be able to have a conversation like really well. Um, so I don't know. I just had sort of different priorities in, in some people, but uh, and I always knew that I was, coming back I, I knew that it was like a three-year thing and i was gonna my goal was to win a job when i was over there and you know come back so i it, it felt this like always tug of like okay how much how many hours do i spend learning japanese versus like should i go practice and i was sort of battling like okay the japanese will be useful now but like not necessarily later i should probably practice more than than learning but i don't know i learned a little bit to to get around but well, if it, if it makes it you feel better about quickly. if it makes you feel better about the, the difficulty in picking out languages, I, I studied Japanese all through in high school uh, and I, I'm also very into food. And there was a Japanese exchange student. I was like, all right, this is awesome. I'm going to talk to this Japanese exchange student and I'm going to ask her, do you watch Iron Chef, which was a huge cooking show. But what I asked her and said was, do you eat Iron Chef? And <laughs> <laughs> I felt like an idiot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there were well, a lot of those uh, moments. <laughs> 
Chad, I, I spent quite a bit of time kind of poking through your history and you won the modern snare drum competition in 2016, but I also noticed that you placed third in 2013 when I think Casey might have been a judge that year. Maybe, and it yeah. seems like it's a common trend among our guests that we've had that have won competitions that they compete more than one year and maybe place third and come back a year or two later and, and win first place. Uh, so what were your takeaways after the first time competing and how did you apply them to your second time or whatever time that was that you won? Yeah, I think, I don't know if I did some of that first one in 2013. I felt like I was more or less just trying to survive because uh, I felt like the rep was pretty challenging that year and I was younger, I guess, and just learning the sheer amount of notes that they were asking us to learn. It was like three rounds with three pieces in each round, so like nine snare drum solos. And it was like, it was a, it was a lot to <laughs> try to take in. And um, yeah, I don't know, like that first year was just trying to, trying to get, get by. Um, and I felt like I did, yeah, did well, well enough that year as best as I could. I think, I think the only reason I did it um, at Carnegie Mellon, they had had um, a handful of students over the, over the years before I got there that, that had done the competition, but like they always finished like second or third. So it was always this thing of like, oh, we got to break the like Carnegie Mellon curse. Someone's got to go win the, win the thing. And so I went, went that year and um, yeah, I don't know place, I think I like tied for third. There was some, I don't remember exactly what happened. There was no winner. It was like a second and then two third places or something. Um, but I was happy to, to do that. That was like the summer before I went to Japan. So I just needed, kind of needed something to, fill that summer and it was a it was a nice change of pace to learn a bunch of snare drum notes i think i did that and spent uh a few weeks as an extra at, at, at tanglewood they needed a bunch of percussionists for rice music for 18 and they were doing some huge opera at the same weeks so there were like 20 percussionists at tanglewood uh for a span of two weeks um so those are the sort of two things i did before i before i left but yeah i just remember leaving that competition and knowing I wanted to come back and try to do it again later. And it didn't really present itself until, until 2016. I think at that point I was maybe near the age cutoff limit. So I was like, okay, I should, I should do it this year before, before I'm not allowed anymore. And, um, I just remember, yeah, having, it, uh, I don't know, just a little bit of different mentality going into it and, looking for ways to, I don't know, in those three years or whatever it was sort of maturing as a player and like, okay, I can play these notes now. This is like a sort of a strange competition. It's a snare drum competition. Like everyone kind of sounds similar. I don't know. It's like, it's like a weird thing that we're doing here. How do I stand out and sort of separate myself from, from a lot of the really great players that are going to be there? Um, and I just remember trying to look for certain things that would, that would sort of separate me. And one of the, one of the things I came up with, I was, uh, I don't know if I came up with it or it was someone else, I was playing for Mike Culligan, who is in the Cincinnati, uh, symphony. I think, I think it was there at the time I'd flown back to America. I was still in Japan at the time, but I, I came back to take a few auditions. Um, in sort of this span of a month, I was doing the Louisiana audition, also the Chattanooga audition that I ended up winning. And then like the next week was the snare drum competition. So I did that audition one and I was like, cool. And then the snare drum competition was the next week. And I was in Cincinnati and playing for, for him. And we were trying to, trying to uh, get this uh, rep ready. And there was a, oh, man, I should have remembered the, to, to look this up. There was a piece on one of the rounds that um, uh, it was, it was a sort of a second line, like New Orleans style um, snare drum piece. It was the, the drummer for Went Marsalis. I can't remember his name right now, but he was commissioned to write a, write a solo. Like they always do. They always sort of pick a, a composer or two to write a solo for the snare drum competition. I think he was- I'll look, of, I'll look that up while you're talking. Sure, I think it was one of the the, the, the guests that year, the composers that year that, that wrote a solo for the competition. And, um, you know, in terms of a classical like snare drum solo, it was like the most basic 
thing that you could imagine. Like I remember when I got the music, I was like, "Huh? <laughs> like what?" Was what it is? was it a uh, tabletop groove by Allie Jackson? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Right. Um, I remember looking at it and being like, "Okay, like this is this is the piece. I have to find something to like do with this. Like this is uh, an opportunity to sort of um, separate myself." And when I was playing for for Cole again. We came up with this idea. We're like, okay, this is you know second line, New Orleans inspired. Like, okay, what can we do? Like, it sounds really weird on a concert snare drum. Okay, like, can we, can we, get like an old drum set drum, and you know, tune it down a little bit, loosen the snares. Let's get a different sound. Okay, cool. That's like one step. All right, that's better. And I was like, oh, what if I like, uh, you know, let's put like a really big tilt on the drum. Let me play it. Oh, I'll play it traditional style. Okay, let's get more. Um, you know, let's, let's try to do what, what, what he's, uh, what he's writing for. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to strap it. I'm going to like find a cymbal strap and like strap it around. And I was like, I'll like walk around the stage and like marching around second line style and, and play this. So I'll have to memorize it. Okay. I'll do that. And I remember it was the, I think it was the first thing on that second round and the few other people that gone before me. I think they just kind of went out and played it on the drum that they brought, which cool. Sounds great. Uh, and then like, I went out there and, and put my stuff at the round and then I, I left the stage and like strapped on the drum and like started playing off stage and like backstage and then like marched in and like around the stage and sort of did this whole presentation with it. I can and, just see uh, everyone else going, oh, I should have done that. <laughs> <laughs> It was one of that like I felt goofy at the time for sure, but I was also like, like this is was, this is what we're doing. I don't know. We're just snare drum competition. Like I gotta do something. Like let's let's have fun. And um, yeah, I remember one of the judges was like, "Yeah, that was great. Like thank you for <laughs> for doing something. That was that was good." So just finding little little moments like that and uh, trying to separate yourself on a snare drum solo. <laughs> Well, one of the pieces from that competition, not 2016, but I can't remember what the year was, but was Andy Akiho's Stop Speaking, which I know Carly plays and has recorded recently. And it's one of my favorite snare drum pieces. I also play it. And you have a wonderful recording of it. And uh, I often, when I hear recordings of this, I'm kind of like, that's, that's not what the score says to do. <laughs> uh, but it, it's it's a just a spot on recording. And especially your your finger rolls are maybe the best snare drum finger rolls I've ever heard. So can you tell us about oh, that really? piece? Uh, well, funny enough, I think I, I used it in that snare drum competition that year. We had a like choose your own solo in the final round. And I had already, I just played that um, for a recital that I did in Japan, where it was sort of all percussion music with like electronics. And so that was sort of, I was in my hands and I was like, this, this will be good. I know they've used it before in the competition. I was like, this will be a good, um, sort of final round piece. Um, yeah, that, that piece is super cool. It's um, every time I play it for someone, especially like a non percussionist or a non musician, they're just like, what is happening? You know, they just, they, they think it's the coolest thing ever. And, and credit to Akiho, like it's really inventive and, and creative uh, of what he did there. And a lot of the music that he's, he's been writing is, is incredible. Um, yeah, that, that, the opportunity to record it came from, from that competition. Uh, I think Pearl had been, you know, the sponsoring the competition and, and sort of reached out at some point after that and said, Hey, do you want to come make a video, come play, stop speaking from the, you know, from your final round and we'll show off the, the drum that they, they gave me and whatnot. And, um, so that was a, that was a really neat opportunity to go over to Nashville and, uh, get set up in their studio and, and sort of make a recording of that piece. I think it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's an awesome piece to play. I'm glad the thumb roll, for some reason, I have this weird memory in my head that the thumb rolls weren't great. I don't know. So I'm glad that they, <laughs> they came off. Uh, oh, Carly, I, Carly, you did like the Grover tambourine ring thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I used the roll ring. Like I, I cut it, I cut it in half. So I had like half just on the left side. Um, but sure. Chad, what's your, what's your secret for the thumb roll on the snare drum? I found it super challenging. Oh man. I don't know. I mean, I think, uh, just having a, I mean, like a, a 
textured head. Uh, I think I just had like an M5 on there. Uh, and I think I was doing probably thumb rolls. I don't know. I have like a really good hitchhiker's thumb here. So it's great for tambourine rolls. I can just like, just like plop it on there and push and it just sort of stays put. So it worked relatively easily on the, on the snare drum and it kind of just lock it in place and go. Um, yeah, I don't know. So jealous. Um, one great, yeah, it's a good, it's a good <laughs> thumb roll. Right. Uh, thumb. You're probably one of those people that can play thumb rolls on tambourine with no wax or anything. Usually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I am not, I was, I was super happy. Like I was fighting with like beeswax on the snare drum head. It's like, this is not working. And then I thought of the roll ring and it's like, works great. It's surefire. It's going to work every go. time. That's a good, you, just, yeah, you have that. to be careful with how many, you know, how many times you run that section. Right. Yeah. I remember <laughs> yeah. like wearing down some of the coated texture on the drum and it was like getting harder and harder to pull off. And I was like, oh no, I, okay, I should change the head. <laughs> and then you get a head that's like really textured and like, you like, you know, tear off your thumbprint and you're like, okay, there's gotta be like a middle ground here. Yep. <laughs> Well, I, I actually, I had a really cool opportunity a couple of years ago. I got to perform that piece in Silicon Valley, which is cool, like, you know, nice. relatively close to Apple headquarters. Uh, but one thing I found in, in live performance, and I know Casey's talked about this with pieces like this a lot, is like the getting the balance of the voice and the snare drum without like blowing out the speaker systems and having the, the voice sound like distorted. Uh, and I... I don't know. It's not really, I don't think too much of the player's choice as to what hall they're performing at or whatever, but have you had any, any luck with figuring out ways to get around that? Oh man. I the Let's see. I don't really remember how it was even set up during the competition. I feel like I had just like a few minutes to like sound check it. So I, I have no idea how it sounded there, but on the recital um, that I originally learned it for in Japan, um, this whole recital was, percussion music with electronics. And um, I remember when I proposed it to, to sort of the, the venue there, uh, there was this uh, sound tech who who got super excited when I when I started showing all the music um, that I wanted to do it because he essentially, you know, he, he works in this hall um, that mainly houses orchestras. And so he's kind of just like, putting up some microphones and like pressing record and like turning on a mic stand, you know, doesn't really like get to use his full abilities. And then uh, when I told him, I was like, yeah, I want to do this, uh, this whole recital with electronics. We're going to have all this, um, you know, percussion music and it's a lot of playback. And then there was one piece where I had the marimba mic and it was running through a sort of delayed system and it would and it would sort of play back and forth off of is that, that the uh nigel westlake uh it's not nigel Westlake. it was it was called zoo um uh, by a it's just from a japanese composer i found it on youtube when i was living over there incredibly beautiful piece um i, I don't think really anyone plays it i don't know i just yeah I totally stumbled upon it on youtube and um it's amazing it was it's really neat um just sort of simple um Marimba solo, you have it, you have it mic'd and it's run through. I can't remember the exact like milliseconds that you need to program it to for the delay, but it turns it to where it's like uh, every it's you hear the echo every like dotted quarter note or something like that. So as you're playing all these nice runs, you're hearing all this reverb feedback from previous notes and whatnot, and you're playing playing against that. Um, and I was showing him all this this stuff I was doing, and he was super pumped to to like bring out all these incredible like s spherical speakers and he like got the whole it was a sort of a it was a stage where there's like 360 seating and so he really wanted to have like the audience experience this in like the best way possible so you he had like this incredible plan of um putting these speakers around the stage and he had like hooked me up with i had these mics like running through my shirt because I was playing um, the Maraca solo. Tumes Tumesca, yeah. yeah. And so he wanted to like pick up the, the Maracas a little bit better. So I had all these like mics like running and he would like clip them on my shirt. There were so many wires everywhere, but he did an amazing job 
finding the balance, you know, for all these pieces that I was playing. Um, you know, it was the Sothis one study, one summary, uh, that, and, and a few other things. And, um, yeah, I don't know. He nailed it because the recording sounds awesome. He, he, he like totally nailed the balance. I have no idea what he did. I'm not really a, like a techie person in terms of, um, you know, everything that he was, he was doing, but he nailed it. It was good. Yeah. And, and full recital of percussion plus electronics sounds like a nightmare. So good for you for going for it and good for him for, for figuring it out. I, yeah. Luckily I just like gave all the electronic stuff me. to him and he, yeah. he figured it out. I just had to worry about playing. Well, Chad, I had one other question before we wrap. Uh, I was poking around on your website and I found that you performed James McMillan's percussion concerto, Vinnie Vinny Emmanuel, and no one ever performs this piece. Um, I got to see Evelyn Glennie perform it in 2009 at the Cranert Center in Illinois uh, with the, I think, Sao Paulo Symphony Orchestra. Um, and it, it's a piece with such amazing colors. There's this bit with chimes at the end that I'll, I'll let you tell us about. Uh, but tell us about your your experience with it, your performance, and maybe why you think it's underplayed versus like the Schwantner Concerto. Sure. Um... And Ksenia chimed in and said it's actually pretty popular in Europe. So maybe it's just us dumb Americans. I was going to say, yeah, actually, <laughs> I feel like it is it is popular in Europe. At least, you know, I feel like Colin Curry, is, he's doing a good job of uh, getting the getting the performances in over there. Um, yeah, uh, I, I actually, that was the first time I heard it was, was Colin playing it in Pittsburgh, I think, uh, when I was studying there. And yeah, I just remember being, it was the first time I was sort of, excited about a percussion concerto i don't normally like a lot of them i don't know they just don't really do it for me <laughs> and the first time i was like hey i, I can i can kind of get behind this one like okay like I, I i see i see what we're trying to do here uh and when i started the job here in chattanooga conductor kyle kutan sort of took me out and she was like do you want to do a concerto and i was like okay never really thought about it before but yeah let's do it she asked what i wanted to do and I knew of a few, I knew the Schwantner and what else was like, give me, give me some time to sort of do some research. I've not, I don't really, I don't know, this isn't my, uh, this isn't my bag. I don't do a lot of concertos. I mean, like, let me see what's out there. I don't really know at this point what is, what's new and what composers are doing what. So I just tried to dive into what's out there. And I just kept coming back to the um, McMillan and uh, Vinny Vinny Emanuel. Something about yeah, I think you said the the colors, all the textures. It it um, I don't know. Yeah, something did it for me. I love the the sort of form and the shape of it. I love how there's no movements necessarily, I and mean, it can be sort of broken into you know five sections. But it's kind of just thirty minutes of nonstop um, music. You know, I love the just the middle section with the. Uh, the marimba sort of cadenza over the top of, um, you know, this this chorale building in the in the winds and the strings. I love the idea of those two things sort of going back and forth with, you know, the marimba thing is pretty much you know out of time and sort of your own little cadenza section, but on top of this beautiful harmony that's starting to swell and pick up, um, and then it it erupts into this uh, at the very end. Um, this incredible moment that you sort of like a, I don't know, the first time I saw it, it felt like a, it felt like a magic trick, like the ending. Yes. <laughs> because you don't, you don't, or at least as a, an audience member, I didn't see, you know, all of the little like metal chimes that every musician in the orchestra had like on their stand. You're supposed to give, you know, everyone in the orchestra these little, and everyone sort of makes it their own way, whether it's, like two little pieces of metal to hit, you know, I think we like suspended some like kind of thick washers on some fishing line and gave everyone like little, I don't know, triangle beaters to hit it with. I can't remember exactly what we did, but essentially everyone in the orchestra has these little metal pieces to clang at the end at this like huge burst and eruption. And yeah, the first time you see it, if you don't know what's coming, it's, it's awesome. It's like a incredible surprise is it overwhelms you with like all of these sparkly shimmery um you know pieces of metal like just all over the orchestra and as it sort of has this two or three minute long decrescendo fade 
down uh, and you're playing some some chime notes uh, at the very end. It, um, yeah, I don't know. I loved I loved that. I guess I don't know. I called it a magic trick. It felt like a magic trick the first time I watched it. It was it was unexpected, and that was. Well, nice. I was going to say like <laughs> it. It's in a sense, it's sort of a gimmick. Uh, it's but all, like, yeah. <laughs> in, in a piece that good, it doesn't come across as like campy or like a gimmick. It's it's yeah, it's it's a magic trick. It's a, it's an actual artistic thing at the end of the piece. But I, I I just I love when a piece has some little bow at the end of it that just ties it all up. Like that was completely unexpected, like that. Um, yeah. So my, as far like, as like endings for a piece, I mean, you know, it could have ended a few minutes earlier at right? the big drummy drummy section and. You know, it could have ended with some bongo lick into a cymbal crash, you know, but it didn't. And that was nice. <laughs> yeah, I think my my favorite ending to a piece of music of all time is the have you guys seen the Andy Akiho uh, ricochet concerto, the, the ping pong the concerto, ping pong, and it ends yeah, with yeah. dumping these giant buckets of ping pong balls all over the stage. Right. Uh, must be terrible to be on stage crew for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a little bit of unexpected um i don't know pageantry it was it was nice well chad thank you so much for your time today before we wrap up is there anything else you'd like to tell us about any upcoming projects you might have yeah in um i think on the 23rd which is a few days before i leave to go to navy basic training <laughs> for my job um i'm giving a, a class on the uh, percussion conservatory uh facebook page on sort of snare drum practice tips, techniques, uh, I'm going to be going over sort of warm up session and how I build, um, uh, warm up into my, my daily, daily snare drum practice. So if you're interested, come check that out. Awesome. And that's, you can find that on Facebook. Is that right? Yeah. There'll be a link on the percussion conservatory Facebook page or on their gotcha. website. Yeah. I was, that's a very cool thing. I was checking out one of their, uh, a recent vibraphone clinic they had on there earlier today. So sure, yeah. great. Well, thank you so much, Chad, for your time. And we will see everyone on episode 299.